you read with me in your Bibles the scripture reading this morning that comes from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 7, verse 13. And it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many ways who enter through it. For the gate is a small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. May God bless the meditation of his word. Andrew, who is the Dean of Men at New World College, will be speaking to us today. Well, good morning, everybody. After being a student for um, a few years, now starting to work here, this is the first time I stand in front of you at this church. Well, actually, the second time I spoke about an hour ago. There weren't as many, but we had a, an enjoyable service. Actually, when I was a student in my final year, I was asked by Kirsten, one of the pastors at the time, to come and speak. You were asked to come and speak at college, at Newbold College, in front of your professors and your, your colleagues and your friends. It's a little nervy. So I went down the gym on Wednesday evening before and managed successfully to break my arm in three places which meant that I was in plaster and my arm strapped up, heavily um, sedated on painkillers. And I phoned Kirsten on Thursday and said, look, Kirsten, there's just no way I can speak. 
There's just no way. My arm's broken. I'm on painkillers. I'm in a mess. I'm really sorry. She said, don't worry. Just get better. We'll find a replacement. So I sat in family housing and I uh, logged in online to, to watch the service from home and found that my replacement was NJ. I don't know if NJ is here. And I was embarrassed to find that NJ also was preaching in my place with his arm in plaster cast. His arm too was broken. <laughs> he had broken it in the same place. The same bone in the same gym doing the same thing as me. But he was about a week ahead of me and was able to speak. The arm is better. And here we are. First time you speak. I've preached many times. The first time I preached as a pastor in my church last year, I always remember that um, I was told by people here, you'll always remember your first sermon you preach as a pastor. It's different. So I turned up in my new church. I had three churches, a big church like this and two smaller churches, about 35, 40 people. And my first Sabbath, I was preaching to the small church and you arrive, and um, I got up to preach. And I'm thinking, this is it. Here goes my journey as a pastor. What possibly could go wrong? And then coming down the aisle was my four-year-old daughter running towards Daddy. She came onto the platform, and I said, Olivia, please, go, go back. Go back. You, you can't be here. No, Daddy. I want to play with your iPad. <laughs> See, I used to preach from an iPad. I don't make that mistake anymore. No, Olivia, go back to mommy. You can't, you can't. Daddy's, Daddy's got to do this, please. No, Daddy, I want to play with your iPad now. <laughs> Olivia, please, this is Daddy's fur. Come on, just go back to mommy. Soon in my way. Come and get her, take her away, please. Daddy, you need to learn to share. <laughs> so here goes, first time speaking to you this morning. The children haven't come forward yet, and the arms out of plaster. The scripture read, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. I love travel. I love to travel. Although I can't travel as much as I used to travel since having children. But as growing up, I just love to travel. When I finished high school, I delayed going to university for about three years in order so that I could travel to different countries, and I worked in two different countries. Then I went to university to study history and politics. And when I completed my degree in history and politics, I embarked on a career in finance for Lloyd's TSB. But the travel bug never, ever left me. The thrill, the working and traveling to other lands just got the better of me. So I walked into my boss's office on that day and I said, I'm resigning my job. I'm going to South Korea to be a Christian missionary. Well, he was kind of surprised. But there began five amazing years as an Adventist missionary in South Korea. And one of the thrills of travel is flying. I used to love flying, but now, as I get a little bit older, I'm not so confident about flying. Something about being 35,000 feet in the air in a compressed unit sounds not so natural. But I used to love to fly. Now I'm more nervous. A few weeks ago, some of us, I see Victor here, we, we spent a great week in Slovenia on the uh, European Pastors' Council. 
And at the time of my booking, I was working for the North England Conference. So I was booked to fly with the pastors from the North England Conference. And we were flying a, a kind of interesting route into um, Slovenia. We were going from Heathrow to Munich, and Munich to Zagreb, and Zagreb to this place in Slovenia that I can't pronounce. And as we left Heathrow, we flew on a, I think, an Airbus, and everything was fine. And we arrived in Munich, and we changed. We had about two hours to, to uh, you know, just to re rest before the, the next flight. And the next flight from Munich to Zagreb was only 40 minutes. Easy, straight up and straight down. And as we walked on the tarmac to the plane, I noticed the plane had propellers on the front. And that kind of made me a little bit nervous when you see the propellers outside the plane. And it was a tiny plane. And as we got on, I saw the president march on with confidence. I thought, well, here goes. It's only 40 minutes. And as we boarded the plane, it was so small inside, smaller than a bus. And we took off, and like a good Adventist, a good Christian, you know, before you take off, you always pray. Be with the pilot, be with the flight, help things to be okay, and if they're not, then be with me. <laughs> and you get up, and once you're airborne and everything's okay, and you're, you're feeling more comfortable, you, you stop the prayer. And then when the pilot tells you you're going to come down, you start praying again. <laughs> help us to land well, and... Well, this was such a small plane, things were starting to do this as we were descending into Zagreb airport. And it was not just doing this, it was doing this as well. And it was getting a little bit nervy, and I was getting a little bit scared. And what I always do when I see a plane behaving in a way that I don't think is normal, I always look at the air stewards and the air hostesses to see what they're doing. If they're just sat on their chairs, you know, filing their nails or doing what they're doing, I know everything's okay. But if I see them panicking, I know that trouble is ahead. And they didn't look too comfortable either. I was trying to keep calm, but I think what finally did it was when one of the senior pastors from, I won't tell you his name, grabbed my leg <laughs> and he grabbed his seat and he looked into his knees and says, Oh dear Lord, we're going to roll. <laughs> that is when I thought there may be trouble ahead. But I'm standing here, we landed safe, and then we took the, the coach into Zagreb. I chickened out on the way back. I said to Vili, I hear you're driving back. He said, Yes. I said, Is there room in the back? I didn't fancy that short trip back to Munich. So instead, I spent 24 hours in a car with Vili. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> but it was great fun. I just loved the thrill of arriving at an airport. Backpack in tow, the Lonely Planet's guidebook in your hand telling you of what to expect when you arrive in a foreign land. And you know, I've had the pleasure to have flown from some great airports. Heathrow, well, some great airports. Gatwick, slightly better. Seoul in South Korea, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Charlotte in North Carolina, Vietnam, Frankfurt, Dubai, Taiwan. But my favorite airport that I've ever flown from is Hong Kong. The airport is huge, built on a man made island named Chek Lap Kok. Thousands of people. It's a city in itself, full of people trying to go here, trying to go there, people in a rush to make it to their next destination. It's noisy, it's busy, but it's exciting. And when you arrive at the airport, you enter through this, this huge entrance into Hong Kong airport. It's one huge big glass structure. It is overwhelmingly huge. Thousands and thousands of check-in desks, hundreds of shops and cafes, 
hundreds of different gates to enter. People, loads of them, carrying with them lots and lots of baggage, ready to begin a journey to somewhere. And as you know, when you arrive at the airport, if you're not flying with Ryanair or EasyJet, you are usually carrying quite a lot of baggage. There's simply too much baggage to carry, so we have to hire a trolley, which used to be free. Now we have to pay a pound. and You don't get that back. But despite the vastness and the magnificence of Hong Kong Airport, despite the fact that there are thousands of desks, lots of entrances to walk through, lots of corridors and hundreds of different gates, the final gate which I must enter in order to get on the plane, the final gate is this big and this high. It's tiny. It's so small that only I can get through it. No baggage, nothing, only myself. And since the 9-11 terrorist attacks, I now have to take off my shoes. I have to take off my belt and I have to take off my wedding ring because only I can go through. Nothing else, no one else. Just me. So after walking through hundreds of corridors, hundreds of different large gates and entrances, I cannot board that plane until I have gone through that narrow gate. That gate which only asks for me and only me. Forget your baggage. The gate only wants you. And I know that if I don't walk through that gate, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stay exactly where I am. But if I free myself of all my baggage, if I rid myself of everything that is not me, then that narrow gate will open wide into an endless possibilities. You can go anywhere once you are through that gate you can literally fly because the narrow gate leads to endless opportunities, a journey of discovery, life-changing moments. Yes, you can literally fly. When Jesus concluded that sermon, that sermon on that mountain, the sermon that set out the counter plan of this upside-down kingdom of his compared to Satan's kingdom here on earth. The kingdom which he said is here, right now. The kingdom that is within you. Jesus concluded by offering us just two choices. Two choices. Two choices between two masters. A choice between two treasures. A choice between two destinations. Limited choices, just two of them, two consequences. And these choices boil down to this. In fact, our whole future depends on these two choices, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Satan, the prevailing culture of today or his kingdom. Aristotle left us with many things. And he left us with a concept that dominates the 21st century postmodern mind, the concept known as the medium or the golden mean. Because today we like choices, don't we? It's a symptom of our postmodern world through consumerism. We demand choices. Today, if you are given a questionnaire to answer, you are given the question, and then usually you are given three possible answers. Usually, yes, no, or not sure. 
Today, we don't like strong views. People do not like yes or no questions. We love the medium. We love the third way. Give me only two choices, yes and no. That is extreme, is the cry of today's world. But the reality is, and you can call me extreme, call me what you want. Jesus only gave us Two choices. It's either yes or it's no. Don't think there is a medium in this. Jesus does not give us that option. So the choice is simple. You choose to live by the rules of his kingdom or you choose to live by the rules of Satan's kingdom. There is no other way, there is no other option. And Jesus demonstrates this choice by using the example of the two gates, two roads, two journeys, two destinations, two choices through two very different gates. The one gate leads to ruin. Call it what you want. Some people call it hell. If you think you can grasp that concept or the gate that leads to endless possibilities, limitless, no boundaries, no time in length, freedom to live with your maker, two gates, two journeys, two very different destinations. I am the door, Jesus said. I am that door, and by men, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Christ is that door. Christ is the only door by which we can be saved. Simply nothing else, absolutely nothing that I can do will get me through. Not one thing I do, not one action will merit access to eternity With God, it is only through Christ, Christ alone, that I can be forgiven. It is only through this door that I have any hope. Jesus knew when he lived on this earth that he was the gateway. He said it, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So I know that Christ is the only way that I can be forgiven. I know that Christ is the only way I can be saved. And I know that he is the gate and the entrance to this. So my question to you this morning is very simple, but it has to be asked. Have you gone through the gate? Are you on that road that opens out from that straight gate. It's a road that opens to endless possibilities, a gate which opens up to eternal life. Have I gone through that gate, the narrow gate? Just like the narrow gate at Hong Kong airport, it will only allow what is essential to pass through, and that is me. No baggage, nothing else apart from me can enter through that gate. But because of my small mind, my sinful mind, I try to take my baggage with me through the gate. And all I do is try to force my bags through this narrow gate, and I end up getting stuck trying to get my bags through the gate And there is a queue of people behind me waiting to go through. And it is me who is blocking them. What do your bags contain? What are you trying to get through that gate? Am I trying to carry my pride through that gate? Is that my baggage? I should lose it as I come to the gate. There's no room. It won't fit. 
If you are carrying self-righteousness, if that is your baggage, then lose it as you come to the gate. There's no room. It just won't fit. If you are carrying judgmental attitudes to other people, if that is my baggage, lose it as you come to the gate. There is no room. It just won't fit. If I'm carrying spiritual superiority and I think that my way of how and when and why we do church in a certain way, if that is my baggage, lose it as I come to the gate. There is no room. It just won't fit. But I can't just drop some of my baggage. Forget Aristotle. You've got to drop it all. It just won't fit. It won't go through the gate. If I only drop a little bit of my baggage, it only allows me and us as people to just come and play church. And playing church is so easy. Because that is the wide gate that leads to destruction. Because you don't have to learn anything to play church. It comes to me so naturally. Being self-righteous comes to me so naturally. And if I want that baggage kept, then I should just enter the wide road because there is plenty of room for that baggage. But I know where I'm going to end up. If I want to keep my attitude of anger towards other people, if that is my baggage, then I can take it to the wide road. There is plenty of room for it there. But I know where I'm going to end up. As I journey through in my life, I believe that Christianity is not just about being good or being bad so much more than that I believe it is so much more involved and so much more in depth than that I believe it is about choosing to be part of God's kingdom right now here on this earth it is not some future event which is going to happen it's happened it is here right now seek first the kingdom of God The kingdom is here within you. Go through the narrow gate and enter in. Or keep your baggage and enter through the wide gate. Two choices, two very different consequences. You choose to take life or not. Your choice, no third way. It's either his way or it is a road to ruin. So as I stand at the gate, Jesus Christ, the agent of my only hope, as I stand in front of Christ, I stand before him, the gateway to which I can enter into life. Christ inaugurated his kingdom through his life and through his death and through his resurrection. And to accept this, I acknowledge that sacrifice. I come to the narrow gate that is Christ and I free myself of all the baggage that I carry. A man ought to examine himself, says one man. Free yourself. Come. Come just as you are to the table. He only wants you. He only wants you to come. Free yourself of the baggage that you carry. Free yourself of the struggles that you bring. Crucify your pride. Crucify your self-righteousness. Crucify everything that you hate and hate of others. Because standing at the narrow gate is Christ. 
and his cross. Come to the gate where you will find the cross. Christ, the gate, our only way for forgiveness, asks us to come and to be crucified with him. For I have been crucified with Christ, and it's not I that now lives. Christ says that he is the gate, and that gate is a straight and narrow gate. Examine yourself as you come to that gate. Get rid of the baggage because it won't fit. Take your cross and be crucified with me, Christ says. Lose your life and all the things you carry, and then you will live. The road that follows is endless. The road that follows through that gate is magnificent. It is limitless. It is timeless. And the destination is eternal life. Come to the narrow gate and be crucified with me. Enter through the narrow gate and sit at the foot of the cross where you will find grace and mercy. But it's your choice. I present to you this morning just two choices. Keep your baggage and take the easy option. Take the easy gate, the wide gate, and end your life in ruin. Or take the narrow gate and come. Come just as you are before your God and choose life. The choice is yours.